As we prepare to dive into our discussion today, it is important for us to be in the present moment while remembering all who have come before us. And with that in mind, uh, we take a moment to acknowledge all indigenous and first people of the land and space in which we live and breathe. For us here at Highland College, we recognize that we are on stolen and occupied Duwamish, Coast Salish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands. And we want to thank all relations and tribes today as we prepare to hold space as a community. We also recognize that all of us are joining this conversation from various places um, through Zoom. And so we also acknowledge the indigenous and first people of the land and spaces in which you are currently occupying. Furthermore, we respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people primarily of African descent who provided exploited labor on which this country was built with little to no recognition. And today we are indebted to their labor and the labor of many black and brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows for our collective benefit. And now I would like to pass the virtual mic to the main host, Karen Fernandez, who will introduce our guest speaker for today's program. Good afternoon, Highline family. I'm Karen Fernandez. I use she, her pronouns. I am a reference librarian. It is wonderful to have you all joining us today for our Disability Justice Week presentation. I am honored to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Paul Lena Paulina Abustan, any pronoun, gender fluid, centers the alternative world making of intersectional disability justice and queer critical race feminists found within youth education, popular culture, animated storytelling, and decolonial Pilipinx learning spaces. As a ninth year higher education instructor, Dr. Abustan has taught within the fields of women's gender and sexuality studies, disability studies, Asian American studies, education studies, and more. Dr. Paulina Abustan is currently a visiting assistant professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Western Washington University. They are a part-time affiliate assistant professor of, high, of educational studies and disability studies at the University of Washington and ethnic and gender studies here at Highline College. Welcome, Dr. Abustan. Hello, everyone. Hello everyone, thanks for having me here. I will share my screen with you. Okay. So welcome everyone and thanks for having me. My, as mentioned, my name is Dr. Paul Lena Paulina Abustan. I go by any pronoun, I'm gender fluid. And my talk today is about queer crip Pilipinx dreaming. So a little bit about me, an image description about me is I am a gender fluid, queer, crip, neurodivergent Pilipinx person with light brown skin, dark brown eyes, straight black hair to my chin. As mentioned, I'm a visiting assistant professor at Western Washington University, Women's Gender Sexuality Studies, and part-time faculty for UW Disability Studies, UW Bothell Education Studies, and Highline's Ethnic and Gender Studies. I'm zooming in from the ancestral homelands of the Nimi Pu and Palouse peoples in Eastern Washington. Today, we will share more about I will share more about my ancestors, community, queer crip Philippinex connections, dreaming kapwa, self in the other worlds, youth education, pop culture animated storytelling, and coalitional activisms. So just a little bit about myself. I grew up in Southern California. This is an image of the Thongba indigenous lands of mountains and shrubs near my hometown, Baldwin Park, California, just a few miles east of Los Angeles. 
And this is also an image on the right of Chumash indigenous lands near my ranch of Cucamonga hometown. Uh, pardon me, that should actually say Cucamonga homelands. I went to school at UC Santa Barbara and I received my PhD at Washington State University. So Santa Barbara is located on Chumash indigenous lands. And this is an image of Chumash indigenous Rocky Mountain and Oceanside lands near my undergrad, UC Santa Barbara, where I majored in feminist studies and political science. And also an image to the right is Nimipu indigenous Snake River mountain lands in Eastern Washington, where I received my PhD in cultural studies and education and American studies degree. So a little bit about my ancestors and my family. Um, this is an image of the ancestral homelands of my Lola, meaning grandmother in Tagalog, one of the Philippine languages. And it is an image of a water-filled volcano in Pampanga, Philippines, where my Lola grew up. And this is the, to the right is an image of the ancestral homelands of my Lolo, grandfather in Tagalog. And this is a cliff overlooking a lush green forest in Cavite, Philippines. In terms of my dad's side of the family who I grew up with because my nanai and tatai raised me, um, I call my grandma and my grandpa on my dad's side, my nanai and tatai, meaning mom and dad at Tagalog because they raised us and I love them very much. So my nanai, meaning mom, grandma in Tagalog, grew up in Pansanhan, Philippines. And this is an image to the left of the sacred waters of Pansanhan Falls. And to the right is an image where my grandfather, um, also known as tatai, meaning dad in Tagalog, um, his hometown in Lukban, Philippines. And it's an image of lush green jungle and mountain forest. So why am I talking to you about my ancestors and my family uh, during Disability Justice Week at Highline? It's because my ancestors, my family, they are a big part of who I am today. Um, and as many ethnic studies, women's gender sexuality studies fields share, it's important to know our history in order to know ourself. Without it, we have no history and we have no self. So in terms of the timeline and background of my family, um, pre-colonial Philippines actually embraced Philippinex gender fluid people and women leaders. Our pronouns were Sha, which means they. So those are that's also one of the other pronouns I use is Sha, which is a gender neutral pronoun. Unfortunately and systemically, Spanish colonizers fed Philippinex gender fluid people and women leaders to the crocodiles. They suppressed our kapwa, meaning self and the other cultures. Um, this is very heavy, but unfortunately, um, my grandfather's dad's clan was murdered by the Spanish priests since they were protesting sexual violence during the 1880s. So this is a very painful history that my family holds and that is in deep, in deep connection with indigenous people here who have also experienced tremendous violence from Spanish colonizers and unfortunately and systemically, we continue to find the remains of kids um, all over the United States, all over Canada. And my family can definitely uh, relate to this as my family experienced violent colonization from Spanish priests and protested and were unfortunately murdered. I'm also very deeply connected to the indigenous people here, the Coast Salish people in Washington, the Nimipu people in Washington and Idaho, because 
U.S. colonizers, which included Washington State and Idaho soldiers, fought Salish and Mimipu peoples as they were um, occupying land and colonizing the people here. And in their diaries, they mentioned how uh, they also fought Filipinx people when the U.S. was colonizing the Philippines in 1898. And they called us Filipinx people as savage. And they called us even more barbaric than the indigenous people here. So we have deep connections and deep ties to the Coast Salish people here, to Nimipu people here, to Chumash people in Santa Barbara, California, to Tongva people in the Los Angeles area. Um, we have a shared, very harmful history of colonizers seeking to wipe us out, seeking to wipe out our women leaders, our gender fluidity, our gender creativity. In World War II, my, unfortunately, um, this is once again very heavy. My grandma and grandpa, my nanay and tatay's village in Lukban, Philippines, was unfortunately burned down and they were forced to hide in the forest. So my grandma gave birth to my uncle in the forest, those lush green forests that you just saw um, a minute ago without any hospital resources because they were escaping violence from 1941 to 1945 during World War II. The Philippines, and also note that the Philippines was a territory during 1898 to 1946. So us Filipinx, uh, we share many, many common threads with indigenous people here, with people in South America, um, with people in the Caribbean, um, in Africa who are colonized. And this all relates to the story of who I am today because during my, during my K-12, I didn't know any of this history. Um, I only heard whispers from my family and stories from my family. And I never saw it in the textbooks. I didn't see myself. I didn't know that gender fluidity and women leaders were honored so highly uh, during pre-colonial times. So I felt kind of ashamed. I did feel ashamed of who I was and I didn't feel like I was enough. Um, and part of that shame is that my immigrant parents, my mom was a doctor in the Philippines, a medical doctor, and my dad was an engineer. When they migrated to the United States, they were unable to practice and they worked low wage jobs and they continue to work low wage jobs today. I am a first generation US higher education student. So in terms of queer, crip, Filipinx me, I first felt shame about who I am because once again, I didn't see myself and the multiple issues I care about, my family, my ancestors represented in K-12 school experiences. However, during my UC Santa Barbara career, I joined intersectional student activist organizations, ranging from Filipinx groups to student of color, conference planning groups to um, feminist and queer groups. And I began to find myself. I began to know my history and to know myself. And I continue to be on that lifelong process of learning to love my gender fluid, queer, sick, neurodivergent, and disabled self. So in terms of my research, why? Why do I do this research? I look at queer critical race feminist disability justice alternative world making happening in youth learning spaces, youth popular culture animated storytelling, and coalitional activism. And I look for these dream worlds because right, um, my family's history, right? We have survived. We have gone through so much. People wanted to wipe out our gender fluidity. People wanted to wipe out our women leaders. People wanted to wipe us out. Um, so we are really looking for dream worlds where we can all exist, um, honoring our multiple bo and diverse body minds. 
So who first, um, you know, started to dream of these dream worlds? Um, I would say it was my great grandfather, right? Who survived the murdering of his clan. And he was dreaming. I know of a world where we could exist and thrive for who we are. So indigenous people, Filipinx people, black indigenous and other people of color, we are dreaming these dream worlds, disabled people, trans people, queer people, and all of us, we are all needed to dream of these worlds where all of our body minds are honored. I love queer black feminist, Audre Lorde, who shares, it is not our differences that divide us, it's our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. So I'm dreaming of that world where all of our differences are honored and where, as Audre Lord shares, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is a self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So a future world where our differences are honored, where we take care of ourselves, where we take care of each other. And I'm also dreaming of a world where there is not a single issue struggle because none of us live single issue lives, according to Audre Lord. So our multiplicities would be honored. So this is an image of various images of Audre Lorde, black lesbian feminists. Another uh, feminist of color who inspires my disability justice dreaming work is Gloria Anzaldúa. And Gloria Anzaldúa is a lesbian Chicana feminist and she shares how the struggle is inner. Chicano, Indio, American Indian, Mexicano, immigrant Latino, Anglo in power, working class, black, Asian. Our sites resemble the border towns and are populated by the same people. The struggle has always been inner. It is played out in the outer terrains. Awareness of our situation must come before inner changes, which in turn come in changes in society. Nothing happens in the real world unless we happen, unless it happens in our heads. So this is an image of Gloria Anzaldúa with her quote, and this is everything to me because, right, we had to first dream it, we had to envision it, um, we had to demand it for it to actually to happen. So, you know, my grandparents dreaming of a world without war, my parents uh, dreaming for a world where we can be embraced for who we are, me dreaming for a gender fluid and queer crip world that is accessible. I need to see it, I need to feel it, I need to taste it before it can actually happen. And we gotta dream it and that's how we can work towards it. So this is another quote from Gloria Anzaldúa who shares, I change myself and I change the world. So all of these changes begin with ourselves. Who are our ancestors? Who are our communities? What is the histories of the lands that we are on? Are we supportive of the indigenous people here? Are we seeking to learn more about sick and disabled people, about neurodivergent people, queer and trans people? So a lot of my work is also inspired um, by Dr. Kathy Cohen and Dr. Sammy Schock. And Kathy Cohen calls for the destabilization and radical politicization of our identities for collective survival and action. And Sammy Schock 2018 shares how disability includes illness, disease, secondary health effects. And that's because people of color and the poor are more likely to experience the borders of able-bodiedness and able-mindedness due to the violence and failures of society to provide access to affordable, quality insurance, housing, and medical care. So these are images of Dr. Kathy Cohen and Dr. Sammy Schopp, um, queer black feminist scholar, Kathy Cohen, and black feminist disability scholar, Sammy Schopp. And you know, this quote is so important to me because as I shared with you all, my family, my ancestors, my communities, my Philippinex communities, queer, crip, we continue to experience trauma on a daily basis in a world that does not accept us for our genuine selves in a world where I do not see myself 
in the K-12 or even higher education curriculum, I don't see my ancestors, queer, trans, neurodivergent people, sick and disabled people within when I turn on Netflix and when I'm watching movies and reading books, rarely do I see stories about my ancestors and communities. So it is important for us, you know, to honor and hold our differences and to honor them and envision a future world where our differences exist and where we thrive. And in terms of disability and illness, you know, think about everything that my grandparents have been through, my great grandparents, my mom, my dad, us, and, you know, the violence of imperialist wars, the violence of colonization, um, the violence of racism and ableism all over our society. Um, it impacts your psyche and your bones and your every day and your fire begins to dim. And so I'm dreaming of a world where we're not made to feel small and insignificant and less. And I'm dreaming of a world where we can truly embrace each other and hold each other for who we are. So feminist queer crip, you're probably wondering, what does that mean? So queer and crip, according to Claire, Eli Claire, 1999, shares how they are words to shock, to infuse with pride and self-love, words to resist internalized hatred, words to help forge a politics, so why am I using these words, queer and crip? And that's because, you know, queer used to be a, a derogatory term and it has been reclaimed by LGBTQIA communities, lesbi lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, intersex, and asexual communities. And crip was also once a derogatory term and is reclaimed by those of us who identify as sick and disabled. We are no longer letting shame and the disappearance of ourselves and our stories take over our lives. We're taking space <laughs> and we're saying, you know, we matter and our issues matter. And according to Kafer, you know, these, this is a way for us to establish a coalitional world where disability is centered. It is not just the footnote you know, within our course texts, within our discussions. Um, it is the center, right? When we think of colonization, colonization and racism, that is founded upon colonizers thinking Philippinex people, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are less, are not smart enough, are not good enough, are not human. And if you think about hetero cis heterosexism, that is founded upon people thinking trans people, non-binary, queer people are not good enough, that something's wrong with us, that something needs to be fixed with us. So by me claiming queer and crip, I'm resisting that hatred and I'm promoting that love within our communities. So this is an image of Dr. Allison Kafer's book, Feminist Queer Crip, which has yellow, red, black, green abstract art. In terms of queering and cripping as a verb, um, McRuer shares to crip is like to queer. It gets at a process to unsettle. So, you know, me sharing my family histories and who I am, you know, I'm shaking things up. I'm shaking the narrative. You know, our communities actually have more connection than we think. And also our communities, um, our liberation is bound as activist Watson shares that, you know, it is important for us to unsettle these narratives where we don't exist, where we are degraded, where we are less. Um, so I'm cripping, I'm querying, and I'm also working towards a disability justice world. And according to McRuer 2018, it forges an anti-neoliberal coalition that imagines a global crip imagination where we counter oppression and generate new forms of being in common. So, you know, the anti-neoliberal, when I share how my parents are continuing to work low-wage jobs, when they are, you know, at the retirement age, um, this hurts, right? So many of our communities are working, so many of us are working two to three jobs just to pay for the rent 
that continues to increase every year just to pay for our medicine, our medical bills, to pay for food, to pay for diapers. And we shouldn't have to work three jobs just to take care of ourselves. So disability justice imagines a world where my mom doesn't have to work two jobs, where my dad, um, you know, doesn't have to go through all of this violence and racism and poverty. So we are imagining a world where we have more rest, where we have more access to joy, access to basic and quality needs. So this is an image description of McRuer's Crip Theory book with purple, red, orange, green abstract art. Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarsingha um, has a book that's called Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice. So this is more inspiration for my work, but she, they talk about the making of the new world, opportunity to dream and keep dreaming, uh, care webs, receiving care, keeping each other alive, and this is an image description of Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarasingha, queer crip femme of color with long green hair, pink lipstick, and a green white flower bush, bush background, smiling, wearing a black shirt next to their book cover, care work. So in terms of our queer crip Philippinex connections, Dr. Lenny Strobel, Philippine X scholar has a book that's called Back from the Crocodile's Belly. And that's because I am here. <laughs> I am back. I am gender fluid. I am queer. I'm Crip. I'm Philippine X. Back, you know, pre 18 or 1800s, the Spanish colonizers, the Spanish priests would have fed me to the, to the crocodiles because I am a leader in my community. I am gender fluid. I am queer. And so now we are re-emerging and we are back and we are working in partnership with black, indigenous and other people of color communities, sick and disabled communities, trans and queer communities to bring back that love for ourselves, for our communities, to take care of ourselves, our land, our water, air, because all of us, we need clean water and air to survive. We need each other to survive according to disability justice. So when I look back at my ancestors, I remember this is why I'm here today. I am back from the crocodile's belly. And so I continue to research, you know, knowing my history, knowing myself, I'm reading more about Filipino Americans. Um, this is a book by Maria P. P. Root that discusses, you know, how diverse and expansive our community is and e, Dr. E.J.R. David has a book called Brown Skin, White Minds. And he talks about colonial mentality. Think about how this is tied to anxiety, to depression, to PTSD found within our Asian American communities, um, especially in Philippinex communities that have been colonized and are continuing to learn how to love ourselves and love each other and take care of each other. So colonial mentality includes feeling inferior for being Filipino, feeling ashamed for being Filipino, discriminating against less westernized Filipinos and those who are considered a uh, fresh off the boat, FOB, a derogatory term, and those desiring lighter skin, and denying and minimizing the historical and current oppression of Filipinos. So Dr. E.G.R. David found that colonial mentality exists within so many Filipinos in the United States. And I have experienced this, you know, my grandma grew up uh, using whitening soap on her skin. I used whitening soap on my skin. I plugged my nose to make it look more European and white and, and less Filipino. Unfortunately, my parents shared, you know, don't play out too long in the sun, you'll get too dark. So colonial mentality means addressing the anti-Blackness in our communities and addressing how we have learned to be ashamed of ourselves and ashamed and that contributes to our mental health and Filipinex experiencing, according to Dr. E.G.R. David, low self-esteem, low life satisfaction, more depression, and more anxiety. 
And so, right, I've had anxiety and depression since I was a kid and I have ADHD. I have chronic body mind pain, fibromyalgia. I have an autoimmune illness and other disabilities. And I wonder, is this an isolation or is this connected to a colonial racist ableist history that so many of us continue to live in today? We are living history, each and every one of us, and we are connected. So in terms of dreaming a world where I love myself and dreaming a world where, where we can exist and thrive, uh, these are some books. Uh, this one is by Melissa and Nievera Lozano called The Philippine Radical Imagination Reader, Philippine Imagining New Worlds Where We Thrive. And this is a book by Gina Velasco, Dr. Gina Velasco, and who discusses queering the global Filipina body and where queer Filipinas can call home amidst the diaspora. And this is another book by Kay Ulundai Barret, who is queer, trans, and who is disabled, who discusses how we are more than our organs and we are dreaming of worlds where our multiplicities can exist and thrive. In terms of my research in the schools, I do this research because, right, I didn't see myself in the books. I didn't see queer people. I didn't see disabled people. I didn't see gender fluid people. So me being in the schools in elementary schools was a testament to how we continue to survive and we continue to thrive. So I loved it when at the schools, kids would call me Mr. Kids would call me Miss. Kids would ask me, what am I? What, what am I a boy or girl? And I love that because I am gender fluid. I am all, I am none at the same time. And my very presence in the schools, right? Crip, queer, unsettled things. And um, so I loved it, you know, when students would ask me questions. And also um, I found disability justice happening in the schools. So students were engaging in rest more and relaxation. So they were feeling at home and able to expand and become their authentic selves. Um, students were building community. They were learning from each other and they were holding each other accountable and supporting each other. They were honoring their differences, um, celebrating their intersectional identities and perspectives. Um, however, although disability justice was happening in the schools, um, kids were you know, feeling disconnected um, since the schools do have so much testing, have so much requirements, are still in a binary system, um, so there was still some, a lot of issues to be worked out in our elementary schools. Um, but however, I did find moments of disability justice and joy happening in the schools. So in terms of more rest in our schools, uh, this is an image of Rilakuma, comfortable bear, wearing a cat suit with a little cat. It's a plushy, a plush. And so I heard many things in the elementary schools of kids saying, it's okay not to be okay. And the teachers I worked with sharing mental health and empathy lessons. Um, teachers encouraging kids to bring their blankets, their, wear their pajamas, wear fuzzy socks, get comfy and bring their stuffed animals. That is something that is lost in higher education. And I wish we could embrace, you know, being comfy, settling, resting more and being okay to be goofy and to be um, in community with each other. Disability justice promotes us uh, being there for each other and resting more, being there for ourselves, showing up for ourselves. Um, so teachers at the elementary schools had a calming corner. They had interactive activities. They had brain breaks. They encouraged students to get up and run around and um, you know, recesses built in. And then also they encouraged gardening and honey um, gardening and also encouraging the beehives to cultivate honey. And they, there was also a lot of singing, dancing, drawing and field trips, something that is lost within higher education, but something I encourage, I encourage with my higher ed students. 
Um, students were building in the elementary schools in my feminist ethnographic research regarding disability justice in the schools. Students were building community. They shared about their highs and lows during morning meetings. Um, even though sometimes they felt left out, they wanted everyone to feel like a family. So they would call each other in according to trans activist TRAN 2013. They call each other in when they're hurt. Instead of pushing each other out, they actually called each other in and wanted to learn how can they make things better. They took responsibility for the individual and collective actions. And they sought to learn more about their local and global community. Example, they were brainstorming ways to end poverty and hunger within our own um, Washington State Elementary Schools community. Um, this was an, an, an image of Pikachu, a yellow mouse Pokemon with a red uh, cheeks and um, a flower. And it's a plush and it's so cute. And it's something I saw and love in the elementary schools. And this is an image of a shirt, a white shirt that says dreamer with a rainbow on it. These are just some of the examples of our kids leading our futures for disability justice and joy. So kids were honoring differences. Um, they were taught that Harriet Tubman, you know, black woman abolitionist um, was actually disabled. And that is something that the history books leave out. Um, you know, history books leave out how those who have survived colonization, black indigenous and people of color communities Many of us, um, you know, have mental health um, stories and issues in our family. We have disabilities, we have sickness. As you know, um, now, unfortunately, uh, there's a high number of Filipino American nurses who are sick with COVID, um, a way higher number in comparison to other nurses. So I'm so happy at the schools, they were teaching intersectional lessons and they were also teaching um, the importance of teachers, um, you know, being able to strike, being able to demand for basic needs met and a quality of life salary, a living wage salary. Um, so I loved how the schools were honoring differences and they were, the teacher I worked for, um, she herself, her daughters are queer and she herself is disabled. So she was just all about the intersectionality. So I love that. We had potlucks, we had celebrations, we sang songs in Spanish. And that is something that I try to encourage in my college classes. Um, although all these amazing dream worlds are happening in our schools, um, it is important to note that our, our K-12 schools, our higher education system continues to be underfunded. Um, schools, school teachers, and higher education professors continue to be overworked and underpaid. There's a lack of resources to teach and support the histories and issues of marginalized students uh, regarding race, gender, sexuality, disability. There's a lack of support for a transformative curriculum. And then also, many teachers may feel afraid to challenge the status quo for the fear of losing their jobs. And it's important to note that many students, teachers and community members are experiencing poverty and hunger. So although these amazing disability justice worlds are taking place in our schools, poverty, hunger, um, students and teachers feeling unsafe for being who they are, for discussing our true histories, and our visions for the future, there's still a lot of fear. Um, another line of my research looks at the dream worlds, not only in youth education spaces, but in youth animated storytelling and pop culture. And you know, all of us, right? We learn so much from, from the, what we consume in the media, what we're watching every day, what we're reading to, what we're listening to. It may even, it's a powerful form of education and maybe even be more pertinent and more relevant than the current K-12 and higher education that we are going through today. Because right, these animated storytellings are pushing us to imagine a different world. Um, so this is a story of Steven Universe and it's an image of Steven Universe. And um, 
They are a boy with a pink jacket with a yellow star on their shirt and black hair. And this is an image of Pearl, who is a pearl, <laughs> and um, Amethyst, who is a purple Amethyst, and Garnet. And I love this show so much and analyze it within my publications, analyzing shows you know, with disability justice taking place, with queer critical race feminist dreaming taking place, because Steven is raised by these powerful women. So it's a super awesome feminist show and they are bending gender and they are talking openly about mental health, something that I didn't encounter um, while I was growing up and the shows that I was watching. Um, this is another show called Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. And it's an image of Korra from the show Legend of Korra, Bending Earth, Fire, Water, and Air. And this show has so much disability justice dreaming in it. Um, Korra herself, um, you know, becomes sick, becomes ill, and dreams of different worlds where all people can thrive. And, you know, she's a brown girl uh, with blue eyes wearing blue. And it's just so powerful, right, to see shows today that kids are watching that have brown people, um, that have powerful women characters, that have sick and disabled characters. Um, so I'm finding these disability justice worlds of rest, of honoring differences, of dreaming new worlds taking place in Korra. And another show is The Dragon Prince. And since I'm running out of time, I'm just gonna briefly browse through these, but this is another show that has great disability justice happening and queer and <clears throat> neurodivergent worlds taking place. Uh, these kids are resisting the scripts that their parents have planned for them. They are imagining worlds where multiple um, dragons, people, elves can exist together. And this is another one of my favorite animes, Hunter Hunter. And there's so much gender fluidity here. There's so much queer love and, you know, discussions of mental health and this is another show where I see those disability justice worlds happening. Fruits Baskets is another one. Uh, so much, so many intimate moments, so many real moments, friendship, love, lost, um, discussions whether someone fits in or not, mental health, um, discussions about gender and gender bending and gender fluidity. So these are the dream worlds that I'm looking for within youth popular culture. And maybe some of y'all are Studio Ghibli fans, Ghibli, um, so many messages in Studio Ghibli anime. Um, this is an image of a forest with a little white spirit and you know, images for a better world, a world that respects all people, our water, our mm -hmm. air. Oh. Okay, I got five more minutes. So let's see here, the next slide. Okay, lastly, um, in terms of my third aspect of my research, I love supporting activism because I myself during my University of California, Santa Barbara undergrad days, that's how I found myself. I found myself by getting involved with Capitan Filipino, a Filipino organization and learning my history and learning the issues of my communities and planning queer Pinoy, Pinay conferences and student of color conferences, knowing the history of ethnic studies and how students demanded that in the late 1960s and were demanding um, for change. So I do my best to support coalitional activisms with sick, disabled, queer, trans, non-binary, black and indigenous people of color, I remember some of these first student of color conferences I attended, I just cried. I cried so much because for the first time in my life, someone was actually talking about my ancestors and someone was actually talking about how my ancestors were gender fluid and were powerful women and how mental health is a huge issue in our communities and how diabetes and illness and heart disease is in our communities and you know, my grandparents didn't have these illnesses, but now my aunties, my titas and titos, 
my parents, me, we all have these illnesses because, right, we're living in a world that is not, is working us to sickness and death. We're living in a world that um, we're eating foods that we don't even know where they come from anymore. And we don't know if the, the waters are polluted. Um, so this was the first time in my life, the Student of Color Conference, the Queer Panay Pinoy Conference, and I, I became an organizer that for them myself, where I began to center our marginalized communities and our dreams for future worlds of disability justice. And so at Washington State University, during my grad program, I co-founded Queer People of Color and Allies, and we remembered trans, queer, Black, and Indigenous people of color loss. Uh, this is me leading this rally, disrupting business as usual. And then it was great because we got the MLK Activist Award and we were recognized. So this is us on stage, a bunch, a bunch of cute TQ BIPOC. And this is us here doing a die-in demonstration. And so we also hosted self-care nights where we would drink tea together because right, taking care of ourselves is important. We hosted poetry nights. We also um, ate delicious foods together. We centered Black power. We centered film festivals that celebrate our trans and Black, uh, trans, queer, and Black women who really co-founded our pride movement and our disability justice movement. Majority of the founders of disability justice in the United States are trans, queer, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So thank you all for having me today. And I do hope you enjoyed my talk, learning a little bit more about me, um, who I am, my ancestors, my family, and how they inspired me to pursue my research. Um, I had no idea I was gonna become a professor. I thank my mentors for encouraging me to apply for my master's for grad school. And now I have been teaching for nine years and everything I teach, I try to be intersectional and supporting coalitional activisms and youth dreaming and youth popular culture, disability justice. So I hope you enjoyed my talk today, everyone. Um, thank you. And I look forward to your questions. All right. Uh, welcome back Highland family. We will now resume with our official Q&A with Dr. Paulina, Paulina Obistan. Um, it looks like, you know, Dr. Paulina was definitely answering a few questions already in the chat. Hopefully you all had a, a quick, nice little break, um, but we welcome you to continue asking any questions through our Q&A, um, or if they are in our chat feature, we'll make sure to double check for that as well. And so I'm gonna welcome my, the main host, Karen, to join me and we'll definitely um, just have a conversation, you know, with um, our amazing guest today. And so, uh, Dr. Paulina, I know we have, there's, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait for a few more questions to trickle in, but just thinking about your journey, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing, like, your history, especially, like, the painful parts, um, you know, about walking us through, about knowing your history and knowing yourself. Um, I think for me, as someone, um, along with other amazing folks on our committee who work within higher ed, you know, you mentioned, um, I think it, towards the end, you gave a shout out to a mentor of yours um, and like how you said you didn't know you were going to be a faculty member. So um, would you mind talking a little bit about what that transition was like, you know, from being like not just an activist and um, organizing in schools, but what was that transition like when you're like, oh, snaps, I'm going to be a professor now. Um, what was that moment like for you? You don't want to share so I just want to say a shout out to, um, you know, Kathy Nguyen here because <laughs> I knew her at UC Santa Barbara and we were involved in Asian American activist organizations together and um, student of color organizations together. But I'm like thinking of those times and, and you know, now Kathy is, um, I mean, she's always been amazing. Um, and now she's, you know, boss and that's awesome. <laughs> um, but you know, when I started UC Santa Barbara, I mean, I didn't even know I was, I, my parents always had the expectations for us to go to college, but I didn't really know what to do. I didn't know what a FAFSA was. I didn't know how to apply for colleges. 
So I'm thankful for my high school teachers, my mentors that walked us through that process on how to apply. And to be honest with you, a lot of my mentors were also the students near me, my friends. And, you know, like if I was a junior in high school, the seniors were my mentors. They were telling me, you know, you know, Paul, you got to apply for, you know, the UC system. You got to pl apply for the Cal States, um, apply for your community colleges. And so they were really, you know, pushing us to apply. So I'm thankful for that. And while I was at UC Santa Barbara, I really think, you know, I was part of education opportunity program, TRIO, um, it works. And to be honest with you, I almost left uh, UC Santa Barbara because as I mentioned, um, you know, my mom worked two jobs. Um, my dad was sick and disabled. So really it was, we were just, surviving on my mom's income and UC Santa Barbara was such a heavy burden because I wanted to be back home with my family and help them and so I really almost left I was literally saying bye to everyone my, after my first uh, semester at UC Santa Barbara because I was working at the dining hall I was juggling school I was having to pick up another job and it, it just all felt too much but thankfully education opportunity program the advisors there, they realized that something was wrong on my application. They said, what, your mom works two jobs. And so they found out that I actually qualified for a bunch of Pell Grants, a bunch of scholarships, and I was able to stay and I didn't have to pick up a second job or anything. And I just worked one work study job throughout college. I worked at the Multicultural Center at UC Santa Barbara, Woo! shout out to the MCC. And you know, it's one of those like, honestly mentors advisors the students in the crowd today talk to them they are your key um they've been through it they're there to assist you and i'm just so glad like so thankful for education opportunity program or else i don't think i would have continued on maybe i would have worked a lot and maybe i would have been tired and that's the reality so many students work and so when I was in women's studies, I loved it. I loved women's gender sexuality studies. I love attending and planning student of color conferences and learning about, you know, all of what I shared. And, you know, my teachers were saying, hey, you know, have you thought about applying for grad school? Have you thought about what you're gonna do after college? And I ended up working in the nonprofit sector for social, economic, and environmental justice nonprofits in Santa Barbara after, since I was already, you know, doing that organizing, uh, get out the vote, um, you know, consciousness raising, knowing our history, knowing ourselves. And so I went into the nonprofit world. And while I was there, you know, I worked with different immigrant communities, um, different low income communities, and I did a lot of educating on you know, stuff that was happening at city hall in state government. And then I would always get compliments from people like, wow, you broke down a really intense topic and heavy topic to something that we could relate with. And I said, oh, really? And that's when I started thinking about me, maybe I should go into education and I should be a professor. And so my, you know, thankful for UC Santa Barbara feminist studies, they were planting that idea in my head. So then I went into cultural studies and education, American studies cognate at WSU, um, got some great scholarships and support. And, you know, I still work throughout my grad program. I taught and that's why I've been teaching for nine years because I've been teaching as a graduate student instructor. So to be honest with you, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I really did it. And and but it was mentors right that believed in me and I didn't really know what to do you know um, my mom is a nurse assistant so she was like be an RN and I felt so bad that I was not listening to my mom and I know a lot of immigrant you know children go through that because our immigrant parents do so much for us that we just want to do everything that they say um, but I'm so glad I, I followed my heart and I, I realized, you know, I love my women's gender sexuality studies. I love, you know, learning about Philippine X communities. And, I, and, and then I went into the world of disability studies and I learned that illness is part of disability, right? Mental health, um, chronic illness, autoimmune conditions. It's not just the physical, it's also neurodivergent, right? Um, 
And so I, it just keeps expanding and I keep learning. And I'm just, once again, thankful for those mentors, friends, ad academic advisors, professors that believed in me. So students in the crowd, please reach out. Your professors would rather have you reach out than disappear. Um, I always want my students to share their entire lives with me. It's okay. Like <laughs> I would rather hear from you than, than me not knowing you. So you're welcome. Like with my students, I'm always like, come talk to my, come, come visit my office hours. I have an open door policy. Talk to me about whatever. Talk to me about Pikachu. You know, I love, I love Pokemon <laughs> and talk to me about anime. Let's, let's just talk because reach out, you know, we're here to support you. So Dr. Paul, our next question is, how were you able to learn how to tell your story? I've always wanted to share more about my history, trauma, but still fail hesitancy around it and would love to hear how you came to this point to be able to share your story with others to bring awareness about these important issues uh, around our intersecting identities. Thank you. Thank you for, you know, all of these questions. And, you know, I, I remember the very moment that, that everything just, you know, when your world basically flipped, my world flipped right side up. Everything was upside down before then. Um, but I was at the Student of Color Conference at UC Santa Cruz. I believe it was 2007, my sophomore year. And they, they had a Filipino American speaker who spoke about her mental health, who spoke about her family, you know, being sick and having higher rates of diabetes and, and um, having higher rates of heart disease, but yet our grandparents, you know, don't. And so it clicked, you know, like this, the colonization, um, the poverty that our, that our communities experience here in the United States, the racism, that all is linked with you know our trauma, uh, you know surviving colonization, surviving wars, experiencing racism, experiencing ableism, and all of the stories she shared with me resonated with me so much, and it resonated with me because I remember my mom sharing stories with me that you know she is a medical doctor, but yet as a nurse assistant, you know people treat her badly, and I remember I was in elementary school and she would share that with me. And it didn't all click until that student of color conference where they were breaking down, you know, decolonization, colonization, um, the Philippine X experiences, the mental health, the trauma, the sickness, the disabilities in our communities. And I remember I just couldn't stop crying. I think I was like crying the whole day. It really hurt. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> y'all are opening wounds here. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it really hurt to just like everything was just validated and the speaker spoke about how there's girls in the philippines who are being sex trafficked and there are um, girls that look like you that you know don't have the opportunity that you have don't have access to education to mentors to housing to food and it just all clicked for me and it brought back those memories when i was a child and we would visit the philippines and, you know, we're going to church, right? My family's going to church and we're in our Sunday best. And I would see kids, you know, uh, taking a shower in the sewer water. And, you know, it was just like all of these moments in my life, I just held them with me. Like, you know, using whitening soap, like my grandma using it, Escanol, and giving it to me to use and giving me a nose plug for my nose to look more white and Western. Like all of those moments just came flooding back. And like everything started to basically make sense. And I was like, I've hated myself for so long. I was ashamed of myself and my family because we didn't see ourselves. And, and I was sad, you know, my parents uh, were working low wage jobs and were working so much. And in a way I kind of blamed them, but now I love them. I love them so much because they were doing what they could to survive. And now I'm working for that world you know, disability justice, we got to take care of ourselves. Imagine one day you can't work. Um, who's going to pay for your rent? Who's going to pay for your food housing? 
Uh, we need to work for a world where we're all taken care of. So that is how I came to my story. It was through plan attending and planning student of color conferences, through my feminist studies major, and then through my graduate program. Just I highly recommend for you to read books, right? That the librarians recommended disability justice books, Asian American books, um, uh, books about indigenous indigenous peoples and indigenous sovereignty and land back movements. And it will be so healing because you will see yourself on the pages and that you're not alone. So that's my tip. Oh, Jerry said, trying not to cry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Auntie Jerry in the chat. Um, we have another question. Um, it is, what are your thoughts and perspective on the recent movement to include critical race theory in K through 12 education? And how do you think local governments can work in a bipartisan way to make this happen? Yes, so I'm all about critical race theory in K-12 in higher ed. And thanks Jerry says, Dr. Paul is teaching, I'm teaching Asian American Roots EGS 142 this winter, sign up. Um, but yes, I'm all about it. Um, and I'm all about, you know, state legislatures implementing a requirement because, right, so many students, all of the research and all of us feel it in our bones. Students don't drop out. Students are pushed out of education. You know, uh, one of my dear friends and mentors, Dr. Subini Anima, has a book called Disability Critical Race Theory. And she talks about how black and brown kids are overly represented in special ed and are underrepresented in gifted programs. Why is that? Um, our teachers are racist. And you all saw that video of that white math teacher, that white woman who was playing native and who was mocking Native American communities and indigenous communities. Well, these teachers are grading you. They are deciding if you're gonna to go to the gifted program or the AP classes, advanced placement classes, they're deciding to spend time to mentor you or not. And so that racism is there. So we gotta, we gotta identify it. Uh, we gotta identify that, you know, kids are being pushed out uh, when they don't see their, when we don't see our histories, when we don't see the issues that we care about, you know, imagining a world where we take care of ourselves, you know, access to food, housing, care, love, community, and just more community in the schools, more caring of each other, caring about each other. If we don't have that, students are going to continue to be pushed out and at the higher education level as well. Um, I, you know, Filipino professors are probably like less than 3%, less than 2% of higher education faculty. Um, there's less black faculty, indigenous faculty, Asian American faculty. So pushing for more critical race theory in higher ed and K-12 will hopefully promote that pipeline. You know, you can be a professor someday. You can teach your families history that is not in the books. You can write that book. Um, I'm currently in the works of getting some book publications, hopefully soon, wish me luck. <laughs> um, but yes, that is my guidance is yes to critical race theory, but also a critical training of the teachers because we can't have teachers wishy-washy teaching this. Um, they need to name it. You know, they need to name that white supremacy is tied to ableism. You know, colonizers came to, to this land and viewed us as not as people. And they enslaved the indigenous people here. They enslaved Filipinos. Um, you know, Filipinos landed in Morro Bay, California um, in the late 1500s. We've been here and we were here because we were enslaved by the Spanish. So, you know, people don't know this stuff. Um, so I'm all about teaching it, but we got to train the teachers to teach it right because, you know, we don't want kids to feel further alienated and isolated and pushed out of K-12 and higher ed. So looking towards what you're going to be doing in your future, you're applying for, this is my question, by the way, um, for new jobs. Um, where do you see yourself um, in terms of, you teach so many different subjects. Um, where ideally do you see yourself teaching? You know, what subject area? 
And can you tell us a little bit more about what that might look like? You know, that's always a difficult question. And, and you know, intersectionality addresses this because racism isn't operating alone. It operates alongside ableism, sexism, um, and it operates alongside uh, cis heterosexism, transphobia, homophobia. So right when, uh, when my Philippinex communities were colonized, when our indigenous black and other people of color communities were colonized. Um, colonizers brought with them, you know, treating women as property, um, treating, you know, just violently erasing LGBTQ people, gender creativity, gender fluidity, um, erasing queer people. And so it is all like all of my work is super <laughs> intersectional. So it's hard to choose, right? Like if someone told me, um, there are three groups to join, uh, for like, let's say like, you know, you open up a group after this and they're like, okay, there's a, a, a student, there's a, a staff and faculty of color group. There is a LGBTQ group and there is a disability group. Which one will you go in? And that's hard because <laughs> I can't, cause, cause I'm all of them, right? Those are all of my identities. Um, my research is intersectional, queer, critical race, feminist studies, so I think I could make a home in all of them. And I have taught in all of them. And you know, us intersectional people who, who are about these intersectional issues, we're pushing, you know, we're pushing and challenging ethnic studies, like, hey, get rid of your sexism and get rid of your cis heterosexism, like ethnic studies. Why do you continue to cite, you know, um, cis hetero males like there are a bunch of amazing women of color scholars and trans women scholars, women of color scholars and indigenous scholars. Like, so we're challenging these fields within the field of women's studies, women's gender sexuality studies. You know, we're saying, hey, you know, focus on trans people, focus on neurodivergent issues, focus on sick and disabled issues. So it's a continuous push um, trying to get us home, you know, home to who we really are. Because every single one of us in this room uh, live intersectionality, whether we, whether we admit it or not, we are all influenced by race, gender, sexuality, disability systems, by histories um, within our own families and communities of indigenous resistance and colonization. We all have some sort of experience, if we look for it, that our families have encountered racism or perpetuated it. As I mentioned, you know, anti-Blackness was unfortunately perpetuated in my family and I'm doing my best to unlearn it. So I, so yeah, Karen, oh my gosh, I could see myself in all the fields. <laughs> so that's what that I can't choose. It, you know, I can't be cut up into little pieces. Uh, this is all of me. And I hope someone can accept me for, for my full me and my, and how my communities are interconnected we are not these separate categories because we actually are all connected. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I have another question in the, in the Q&A, uh, which is what is your favorite thing about your Philippine X history and identity? Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> so uh, somewhat, you know, food. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I love you know, lumpia, and I love Funset and ube. And you know, it's one of those, I do think, you know, food, the simple sharing of food, tea, and, you know, just, I, I love how someone in the chat said, <laughs> you know, let's watch a movie or let's watch an anime and analyze it together. I think those are the things that are going to bring our world together, because we got to break bread together and share that, you know, we're actually family. And, you know, I know I focus a lot of my conversation on Black, Indigenous, and people of color, but we need our white allies. Like, white allies are our family as well and need to acknowledge the pain that has happened and that we are working to end that pain. So, you know, I've been teaching at WSU, UW, Western here, and I bring my students lumpia. <laughs> I, I, I cook lumpia for them, uh, green tea cookies, ube cookies. 
And immediately, you know, just the tensions, everyone like relaxes. And I think that's what we need more in our world is that disability justice that let's rest together, let's joy together, let's laugh, let's eat. And then it makes it easier, <laughs> you know, to talk about those hard conversations like, hey, you know, that racist thing you said the other day <laughs> or that you did. Um, and then they know that I'm coming, you know, my students hopefully know that when we have these difficult conversations together, it's out of love, you know, and I admit, like, I grew up with so much anti-Blackness. I'm unlearning that. I'm trying to do better. Um, but when we eat together, when we laugh together, when we over anime, over what we love, Pikachu, um, it just, it helps us relax. And then we can better, you know, talk about these issues. So Filipino pride, lumpia forever. <laughs> Edwina, yes, you can join my class. <laughs> Thank you. And yes, Maile Lupa, Lupe. Karen, I think you're, oh, you're on mute. Okay. So there was a question about, you talked about about uh, indigenous people in Washington and I think Idaho. Um, can you clarify about that? Yes, so um, if you look at Maria P. P. Root's book, Filipino Americans, um, there should be a chapter in there that shares how, you know, Washington was, you know, colonized later in the game. Um, my, my chair of my women's gender sexuality studies program at Western Washington University actually does a indigenous tour, history tour of Bellingham, Washington. And Bellingham, Washington was colonized like 1880s. Um, so just, you know, a little bit, 100 years ago, it used to be 100% native, according to Dr. Joshua Soretti. Um, and then now it's less than 2% native. That is a very violent history and that is very real. And so the Coast Salish people, the Nimipu people, um, I've done research with Nimipu people um, in Eastern Washington and Idaho, but we share um, different yet connected histories of colonization because the very same US, Washington and Idaho soldiers that colonized Coast Salish and Nimipu peoples of Washington and Idaho during the 1880s went over to the Philippines during the 1890s to colonize us. And they labeled, this is in the soldiers' diaries, they labeled Filipino Americans more violent, more savage, more barbaric in comparison to, you know, they didn't call to um, Coast Salish and Nimipu people. Um, so we share a common history that, um, you know, different yet shared that our communities, you know, and this is where ableism comes in. They already viewed us as not human, as less, as not intelligent, as not capable. And even though, you know, people say they're not racist today or not ableist, it's just the way someone treats you, you know, like if someone is talking down at you or someone doesn't believe in you to, to accomplish something, you're one of your dreams, like that is ableism because they're believing that you are less or that you're more dangerous or, you know, you're not qualified. So that is what the story is with the Washington and Idaho soldiers. And people don't, you know, my grandma, um, she passed, unfortunately passed away of COVID last year, but you know, she's living history. Like she survived World War II and it was my grandparents' parents that they were systemically killed by Spanish priests because they were protesting violence. And so all of this, like, it, you know, they always say like it in the history books, they kind of make it sound like a long time ago, but it's actually very alive today. Like Bellingham, it was just 
a hundred or so years ago, 100% native. So our communities are more connected than we think. Thank you, Dr. Abustan. Um, I know we are approaching the end of our time together and there are actually a lot of great questions that folks have in the chat. Um, but this, I mean, it's hard to choose one question, let's see. Okay, this is a fun question. Someone asked, mm -hmm. who is your favorite Pokemon and favorite bending ability? Oh my gosh, uh, thank you for whoever asked that question, you're amazing. Um, my favorite Pokemon is Celebi. Um, I think Celebi, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting, but <laughs> but they're like this little green, like kind of look like a mouse. Um, and they're like kind of like celery, like they're green. And they only show up when, uh, during times of peace and environmental sustainability. So they're from the future. And like they will show up when we're living in a world of peace and environmental sustainability. So I love Celebi because right, it's to Celebi's disability justice because right, let's work towards that world where we all love ourselves, we love each other, there's peace, there's sustainability, we're taking care of each other, we're resting, we have joy. So Celebi, but also of course, um, I love Charmander, Bulbasaur, Squirtle. I love the starter pack, <laughs> the starter squad. Pikachu and Eevee. And then my bending, I'm, you know, I'm wearing green. I'm totally an earth bender because I have a lot of anxiety flying on a plane and I have a lot of like claustrophobia and OCD. It's actually always scary for me to fly in a plane. Like I will cry. And that's why I have my service dog, Milo. Um, he helps me, you know, with my PTSD, anxiety, um, chronic body, mind pain, um, but I, I'm, I need a, I'm like Toph Beifong that I need to keep my feet on the ground. Like I cannot fly an oppa. <laughs> the, 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 so yeah, okay, we're, we're, we're nerding out here. So <laughs> basically I'm an earth bender. I love, I love my pothos plants. I love my plants and I cannot be in the air. I need, I need my feet on the ground. So yeah, <laughs> I'm like Toph Beifong. Everyone, Avatar The Last Airbender and Pokemon, get on it. <laughs> and also the Dragon Prince. It's from the same creator as Avatar. My How dog is two years old. And he was fully trained by the, by the prisoners at Othello Ridge Corrections. He's a sweet baby. And he came with me on campus. Um, I see... My dog Milo, he's a black labradoodle. I see him more as like, um, more as someone who makes sure I'm okay. He, he helps take care of me. Part of my family that helps take care of me. This concludes today's presentation. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Paul, Lena, Paulina, Abustan for your wisdom and powerful message.